Hello, BookTube. I've got some more mail for you today on an absolutely gorgeous Monday. Just beautiful. Really walking around in the woods and in the fields and whatnot on a day like today. You really do feel like this is the last of summer. That's always what these days feel like. I think tomorrow is going to reach 85 degrees Fahrenheit in Boston, but after that, the temperature just goes down and down. I don't know if we'll have a high like that again for months. Uh, it won't actually get cold in Boston, but it will stop being warm for sure. Uh, of course, that's not true for a lot of you, right? A lot of you are still in this endless, crushing heat wave that would not go away, that was never alleviated, it hasn't been broken since mid-June. A lot of you are still in that weather, but Boston seems to be adhering to the old routine, where we will get a cooling off period after summer. It's not the full old routine, because we used to have four seasons here in Boston, and now we don't anymore. We don't have winter. Uh, but we still have the three. <laughs> the three is still holding on. So it's been lovely. Absolutely lovely. The kind of day where you can have all the windows open, the sun bathing my shelf of potted plants, all of which are still thriving. Uh, although one of the potted plants, the Monstera, wants the others to thrive a little less. It is constantly trying to block their sunlight with its much bigger branches and limbs and whatnot. Uh, really kind of weird. Uh, I know, I know, the, the book Planta Sapiens is still on my mind. It's one of the most sticky books. One of the books that stuck with me the longest in 2023. I know that that's probably on my mind a little too much, but this looks... To, I know this is probably just a reflex. Uh, to something that's, that's dictated by the reach of the plant and the, the warmth of the sun. But it really does look intentional <laughs> to me. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, we've got some mail. We've got some periodicals. I got the uh, the TLS, Long Times Literary Supplement. Look forward to consuming that. I got the Martha's Vineyard Gazette, uh, which is a, a really a, a lovely uh, small town paper that just happens to be serving a small town that has many, many multimillionaires. This is Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, it, a wonderful thing to do. I don't know that, I don't know, the TLS I can recommend to any bookish person, but the, the or maybe not. <laughs> the TLS is really the deep end of the pool when it comes to bookish criticism of a popular weekly genre, but the, the Vineyard Gazette would be even harder to recommend. It is all Vineyard news. I could only recommend the issues in which I appear. I am their books editor, their books reviewer, uh, but it's the off season now, so the the flow of books is going to is going to dry up to a trickle. Uh, but there's also mail. Uh, just a few packages here uh, to sort of scoff at the fates that cursed the mail for this channel for a long time. Let's see what this. Oh, oh, fantastic. Okay. I don't have an ebook of this, but oh, when you want when it's an art book, you really want the finished copy. And this is lovely. I did not know that this does not have a dust jacket. Uh, this is Benjamin Moser. This is his book, Upside Down World: Meetings with Dutch Masters, and it is uh, a naked hardcover with blurbs printed onto the cover that I've very seldom seen, uh, and it it's full of uh, full color reproductions. They're not just in a block. They're all over the book. They're on all kinds of pages. This is all about... Well, we can read about it. Uh, Benjamin Moser found himself visiting, casually at first and then more and more obsessively, the country's great museums uh, in an ancient Dutch town. Inside these old buildings, he discovered the remains of the Dutch Golden Age and began to unearth the strange, inspiring, and terrifying stories of the artists who gave shape to one of the most luminous moments in the history of human creativity. Beyond the sainted Rembrandt, who harbored a startling darkness, and the mysterious Vermeer, whose true subject, turned out, was lurking in plain sight, Moser got to know a whole galaxy of geniuses. Oh, fantastic. All right, well, this is all about that. I, this is a terrific book. Uh, very glad to have a pretty finished copy. That's wonderful. Uh, wonderful and also non-problematic. So let's move on to this next one. It also is a finished copy. Uh, what have we got here? Oh, great. Oh, fantastic. All right. Uh, all right, we're two for two. Uh, this is right up Steve's alley. <laughs> this comes out in early November. This is by Don Holloway, uh, who's the author of The Last Viking, that I really liked. A lot of you really liked it as well. Uh, I wonder if uh, The Last Viking is blurbed in this book. It is not. All right. This is his new book, Battle for the Island Kingdom, England's Destiny, uh, AD 1000 to AD 1066. So a crucial century in English history. 
uh, a rich history of the years leading up to 1066 when Vikings, Anglo-Saxons, and Normans vied for the English crown. This book reveals the life and death struggle for power which changed the course of history. The six decades leading up to 1066 were defined by bloody wars and intrigues in which three peoples vied for supremacy over the island kingdom. In this epic retelling, the author recounts the clashes of Vikings, Anglo-Saxons, and Normans, their warlords, and their conniving queens. So the first paragraph says it's one sentence three different ways. <laughs> uh, reminiscent of Game of Thrones and the Last Kingdom, the saga begins with the Viking Knut the Great forging three nations into his North Sea Empire, while his Saxon wife, Elgifur, uh, Elgifu, rules in his stead. Her archenemy, Emma of Normandy, widow of Saxon King Ethelred, claims Knut's realm in exchange for her hand in marriage. Their sons become rivals, pawns in their mother's wars until they can secure their own destinies, and always in the shadow is Godwin of Wessex, playing all sides to become the power behind the throne so his son Harold can emerge as king of all England. But Harold's brother Tostig turns traitor, abandons the Anglo-Saxons, and joins the army of the last great Viking, Harold Hadrada, where together they meet their fate in the Battle of Stamford Bridge. And all this time, watching from across the water, is William the Bastard, fighting to secure his own Norman dukedom, with, but with an eye on the English crown. Who will prevail? in battle for the island kingdom. Of course, we know who will prevail, but it doesn't matter. This is early November. This is the finished copy. Do we have any illustrations in here? Okay. Unlike the Dutch Masters thing, this has just the normal inset of, uh, of color photos. Uh, great. Fantastic. I love, I love this period in English history, and, uh, and I like this author. His, uh, the, his, the one and only book of his that I've read, I really like. So... His credit in the Bank of Steve could not be higher. That's wonderful. Early November. Uh, and then the uh, final package here. will be done. Looks like another finished copy. Uh, that's wonderful. What have we got here? It's a cute little thing, whatever it is. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, it's Japanese fiction. This is by Hiro Arakawa, and it is translated by Philip Gabriel, and it's called The Goodbye Cat from the author of The Traveling Cat Chronicles, so I'm sensing that this author and I are not on the same stage of our journey in life. <laughs> uh, this comes out in, on October 10th. Uh, let's see here. Uh, in 2018, Hiro Arakawa's The Traveling Cat Chronicles became something of a sleeper hit here in the U.S. A Japanese-language translated novel following Nana the Cat and his subtle observational wit and his life-affirming journey with his kind-hearted owner, Satoru, as they take to the road to reconnect with three of Satoru's longtime friends. The book was an indie-bound and Los Angeles Times bestseller. Uh, it was a joy of a book to read and to work on. Now, Arakawa has graced readers with another charming book, The Goodbye Cat. Instead of one cat on the road with his owner, The Goodbye ta Cat tells separate stories of seven different cats who weave their way through their owner's lives, climbing, comforting, nestling, and sometimes just tripping everyone up in this collection set against the backdrop of changing seasons in Japan. Uh, hand mauling for no reason was left off that list of cat activities. We have climbing, comforting, nestling, and sometimes just tripping, but not hand mauling for no reason. <laughs> that doesn't come on. Uh, bursting with love and warmth, Okay, that must be the humans involved. <laughs> this book exquisitely explores the cycle of life from birth to death, as each, <laughs> each of which takes place behind the couch. <laughs> as each of the seven stories explores how, in different ways, the steadiness and devotion of a well-loved cat never lets, what, never lets us down. Notice the cat is well-loved, not the people. <laughs> You're devoted to your cat, yes, and you have full-blown Stockholm Syndrome because the more your cat bites and mauls you, the more devoted you are. But it's not that the cat is devoted to you. <laughs> uh, one of them shows, one of the stories shows a young boy not to stand in nature's way. Another perplexes a family for the cat's undying devotion to their charismatic but uncaring father. Another features an elderly cat that hatches a plan to pass into the next world as a spirit so that he and his owner may be in each other's lives forever. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> obviously this is going to be extremely reminiscent of not only the author's earlier book, 
but for obvious reasons of Soseki. <laughs> so I managed to get through Soseki. I will certainly get through this. It's clearly not aimed at me, <laughs> but, uh, but that's okay. I know, and for those of you who might be new to the channel, I not only play for the other team, I am the captain of the other team. So, <laughs> But we have uh, the Battle of the Island Kingdom, we have the Upside Down World, and we have the Goodbye Cat, uh, which it's going to be it's contemporary Japanese prose, which I have my problems with, but at least this has some sort of structure to it. It's not just uh, a young person who's around the age of 22 who's so tired all the time that they can't keep their eyes open and they just sort of shuffle in place and then about, at, it, they're always 100 pages long, and about the 90 page mark, it starts to rain and it rains for a whole hour. The end. <laughs> at least this seems like it has more structure than that. That would be great. <laughs> of course, it's, it would be pretty hard to get less structure than a contemporary Japanese novel. Zombie fiction. So we'll see if this is that. Uh, but anyway, not a bad mail home. Not a dud in the bunch, actually. Because although I'm being, I'm being teasing with this cat book, I am endlessly curious about contemporary Japanese literature, even though a lot of it strikes me as downright weird. Ja downright anesthetized. I still read it all. So, so uh, this is great. Fantastic. We had a little bit of everything here. So I'll wrap this up. Another successful mail haul, a successful mail haul to start the week. It's not completely successful, nor is anything else in my life. No meal, no shower, no nothing. Because the event that is going to transmogrify my life has not happened yet. That may happen in this week's mail, but it hasn't happened yet. Oh, well. These will do. <laughs> These will tide me over. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.